Dr. Watson, thank you so much for joining the show, for taking the time to talk to us. You're an inspiration. And as I've read more and more about your story, I'm just blown away by the man you are today. And maybe we start there, like um, maybe tell us a little bit about your background, um, what it was like growing up and, you know, how you found the resilience to continue. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, Clint, thank you very much for having me. And I appreciate the work you guys are doing with your show as well and getting the word out there about CEOs and overcoming obstacles as well. So um, as you mentioned, resiliency is a, a big part of who I am. Um, it wasn't by choice. It was by happenstance. Um, as you mentioned, you know, growing up in Denver, Colorado, uh, things were pretty tough. I grew up with, with parents who were drug addicts and shoplifters who actually were arrested 121 times by the time I finished high school. Clint. Uh, imagine that, yeah, 121 times. So as a kid, I spent a lot of time in foster homes, crisis centers, motel rooms, bounced around from place to place to place, numerous schools. Matter of fact, between my second and third grade year of school, I went to four different elementary schools. Um, met my oldest brother by pure coincidence, Clint, in a, set, in a foster home in second grade. And then in third grade, found myself living with my aunt. And I was a very distraught young man. I was a person looking for connections and the gangs seemed to be very, very appealing to me. But luckily during this time, I got me involved in sports and sports became, a, became my saving grace and got involved in basketball. I did that for a number of years. By my seventh grade year of school, Clint, I was back with my mother and father for two years. We found ourselves in another very difficult situation, beautiful sunny day in the city of Denver. We look up and we get kicked out of our house in front of all of our friends. All of our stuff is thrown into the front yard. And then my family of nine of us moved into our seventh motel room with nine people, one room, two beds, one bathroom, my entire eighth grade year of school. Uh, six of the adults were using drugs in the room, and me and my little brother and little sister left to fend for ourselves. And during this time, the thing that kept me going, Clint, was my yearning to stay involved in sports. So I was literally walking seven miles from Commerce City to Denver, to uh, um, the Recreation Center in Denver to stay involved in sports and going to school as well. Now, I didn't know quite sure where that was going to take me until I got an opportunity to meet a coach from a private suburban Denver high school, came to the inner cities of Denver and talked to me and my comrades about the chance of going out to this private suburban Denver high school. Now, I remember he mentioned the words, Clint, he mentioned the words, if you come to this school, it's going to be a pretty good chance you can go to college. Now, I wasn't quite sure what he meant by that because no one in my family had ever gone to college, but I said, there's something to that. I want to experience that. So while living in that motel room, for the first time ever, I went and got on the honor roll. Um, and again, this is no parental support, honor roll, became the one um, a wrestling champ in my school, won an award that was given to a handful of kids in the entire state of Colorado while living in that motel room and was blessed with the opportunity to go to that high school. But initially my parents were not supportive of me. So my parents ended up going back to prison in my eighth grade year of school. And my little brother and little sister and I moved with my uh, grandmother who came out of retirement to take care of us. And she moved us into the heart of our neighborhood, neighborhood which was now being called Little Compton because of all the gang members that had migrated from LA were now in Denver. Mm. And it was my grandmother's wish that I go out to this high school and do well every day. So Clint, I took three city buses, one way starting at 6.30 in the morning to high school every day. Um, and then we'll do the same thing on the way back when sports over with, I get home anywhere between eight and 10 o'clock at night. Did that for a number of years. By my junior year of high school, my grandmother who I was living with had developed Alzheimer's disease and had to be placed into a nursing home. My little brother got heavily involved in gangs and was shipped off to a juvenile prison after taking a gun to school. My older brother was now coming back around because he had ties to the same gang as my little brother. My older sister was now addicted to crack cocaine on the streets of Denver, Colorado. My younger sister was now living with my aunt. Um, during this time, my mom got out briefly, but no one would give her a second chance, even though she was trying to do the right thing. And my mother ended up selling drugs to take care of us. And in the middle of my senior high, senior of high school, I received a daunting call that my mother had just been busted for selling drugs and was on her way back to prison again. Hmm. So this time I'm a senior All-American football player. I've had over 30 scholarship offers and my life is falling apart. My mom goes back, she's arrested now for the 44th time. My dad was arrested for the 77th time. I didn't have anywhere to stay at. A friend of the family comes through and says, hey, I'm gonna let you sleep on my floor, but you gotta be out come May. And I struggled to graduate from high school, barely graduated from high school, and then was shipped off to the University of Minnesota um, a couple of days after graduation. And I remember uh, leaving the Denver, Colorado and not knowing what the future was gonna hold for me. And I got to the University of Minnesota Keep in mind, the University of Minnesota is like the third largest college in the country. They had never had a student athlete come there in my circumstance. So I got there. My mom was in prison. My dad was in prison. My little brother was in prison. My grandmother, who was my last legal guardian, was in the nursing home. My oldest brother was back there involved in gangs. My oldest sister was back there on crack cocaine. Second oldest sister was in foster care in Iowa. 
between my junior and senior year of high school, I lived in five different locations and came to University of Minnesota with no home address. And it came down to either going to the NFL or the academics. And I was certainly sold on the NFL dream until I got injured. And then once I got injured, I had to turn my, my vision to making sure I was going to get the degree because I knew I couldn't return to where I had left in Denver, Colorado. So I went and got my degree. When I got four degrees, became a school principal and uh, turned a, a low income school around and, you know, did some great things for students and, and staff had a great, 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 great school of uh, folks. And then left doing that about 13 years ago, started my own business, coaching, consulting and speaking. So I've been doing that when I'm in the country, written a number of books and, uh, you know, um, trying to motivate people to be the best they can be corporations, you know, speaking to NFL, to uh, McDonald's, you know, spreading the message of, of, of motivation and resilience to whoever wants to listen. So again, it's a pleasure and honor to be here to share that story with you. Well, wow. It, it, it's unbelievable to, to hear your story. And, I, and I've read a lot of that, but man, just hearing you talk about it, it, it it's in, inspirational, man. Um, I have a question for you. When you were in that motel for a whole year, um, we said there was like seven or eight folks, right? And nine of us, yeah, nine. nine, nine folks. And then, you know, six of the adults were, were doing drugs in the hotel room. Yeah. What, I, I'm just so curious, like, what were you thinking about? What did you think your future was going to be? Yeah, that's a great question, Clint. And, and again, it's a, it's a motel room, not hotel. I tell people hotels are the fancy ones, motel. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We're in a motel. So, you know, um, I never gave up my dream of going to the NFL, I mean, to the NBA. So, um, you know, I was always dreaming beyond my circumstances. So when this coach came to the inner cities of Denver and talked to me and my friends about the chance to go out to this high school, I said, that is going to be the blueprint I'm going to use. That is going to be the ticket I'm going to use to get out of this situation. So <clears throat> I just, I was constantly dreaming beyond my circumstance. There was never a piece of me that ever came to a place where I said, Hey, this is going to be my future. And in fact, I, I had a disdain for it so much that it was, it was a, almost hatred that I hated being hungry. I hated not having clean clothes. I hated not having my parents around. I hated being made fun of at school. And I, I wanted something different. And so I was so hungry to make it out of the situation that I was willing to do everything that it was going to take to get me out of that situation without doing anything that was going to be illegal. So I, I never gave up. So, you know, I'm a big fan of being able to dream beyond your circumstances. There's, there's amazing things that happen when we dream beyond our circumstances. And it's a transferable skill that we can do in every aspect of our life. So even in that motel room with nine people, everything around me telling me I shouldn't dream, I kept the dream of what was potentially possible for me going forward. When you meet with, you know, various clients and, you know, these speaking gigs and, you know, you're your coach, how do you encourage, how do you encourage them to dream beyond their circumstances? Yes. Yes. That's a great question. You know, one, one of it, uh, you know, Clint, we oftentimes I tell people that you've already survived a hundred percent of the things you didn't think you could survive. So oftentimes it's a matter of getting people to reflect back on, on their journey and recognizing that they, they, have, they have shown resiliency in a number of situations, no be it doesn't mean if it's big or small. You have to be able to take those aspects of now and use it in other areas of your, uh, of your life and your journey. So one of the big pieces of, of resiliency starts with motivation. And you have to connect to your values because, again, one of the things that I value by living in that motel room was I valued the fact that I was going to go on and play in the NBA someday. So that kept me motivated, kept me going. And then I had to have a vision. So I, I began to dream. I would watch the Denver Nuggets who were doing very, very well in the playoffs. I would watch guys on the team and i say, I'm going to be like that someday. I would listen to other stories of hardship, you know. And then I finally got a chance to go to this, this, this high school and uh, met some great educators in my life. And they helped me to begin to create some additional traction to that story of how I was going to possibly make it out of there and begin to make the journey a little bit more specific. So again, I tell clients that I'm working with, you got to be able to dream beyond your circumstances, but it starts with one, reflecting on your journey, knowing that you have it in you to do this, identifying your values, and then coming up with those visions and those best practices and those models of success for you. And then you got to become your biggest cheerleader. You got to know how to you got you to gotta keep yourself self-motivated. It's one of the best ways to do that. And in the, in the area of sports, we do this a lot. You know, coaches, they're very, very uh, savvy on doing this. You got to be able to come to your biggest cheerleaders. So that may be finding music, finding quotes, 
finding books, finding stories that keep you inspired. So those are some of the basic things I tell people you got to do to, to be resilient and stay motivated in the journey to be able to see beyond your circumstances. And then what do you do when your dreams change or yeah. your dreams don't work out yeah. and you need to make that pivot? How do you continue to stay motivated? Like, like you said, like you got injured and so yeah. all of a sudden your dream had to change and you had to pivot. Um, what do you do in those circumstances? Yeah, that's a great, great, great question there. Um, one of the biggest things you can do is you got to look for stories of other individuals who have also had to pivot and know that it's OK to pivot. Um, sometimes we think when one goal doesn't work out that we're a failure. But I tell people failure and success are a circle. So sometimes you're going to be in the valley. Other times you're going to be on the mountain. It's OK when things don't work out. What you don't want to do is be stuck in the valley. So you got to ask yourself when you're in the valley, what am I need? What do I need to learn? That's that's when you have to become a student. You got to become a student. What am I learning? What am I uh, getting from the situation? How can I do something different if I find myself here again? And then when you're on the mountaintop, you want to be able to share those best practices that you receive from being in the valley. So, again, the pivot always goes back to and it starts with what am I learning in this particular situation? Because, again, we all find ourselves there particular times in life. I'm super interested, like, for some reason, like, the the motel room is, like, sticking yeah. out in my head as, as I hear you talk as kind of like a foundational moment in your life where you had a choice to make. And, yeah. and it seems to me like the choice was, do I treat myself as though I matter? Yeah. Or do I not treat myself as though I matter? And, you know, there's a very obvious path I can take, yeah. maybe even an easy path, although really difficult. But at the time, I'm sure it seems somewhat easy yes and what what you managed to do which i think is so inspirational is like treat yourself as though you matter in that moment mm. even when the circumstances were so dire as they were and uh also treat others as though they matter just as much as you do yeah. you know like that that really that's a really hard thing to do and the, the fact that you were doing that um at such a young age and you continue doing this through your life is just remarkable this idea of no one matters more than me and I don't matter more than anyone else. Absolutely. And you had this mindset of like, this is true at that young, like, like, I'm just so fascinated, like where that came from, how you how, like, like what led you to like, I matter yeah. right here. Um, and when everybody else around you was like treating themselves in, in some way or another as though they don't. Absolutely. That's another great question, Clint, as well. And now keep in mind, by the time I was in eighth grade, eighth grade is young for most people. But by the time I was in eighth grade, I'd, I'd lived and I'd gone through so much. I mean, mm -hmm. I'd lived in numerous foster homes, crisis centers, motel rooms. I'd been through this stuff at an early age. So I got the sting of what it felt like to be made fun of at an early age, go to school with dirty clothes, not having food, only getting my meals from school, having my parents disappoint me, being shuffled around from place to place. I experienced those things at an early age. So by the time I was in this eighth grade uh, motel room, I was gung ho that I was not, that was not going to be my future. I didn't like that, so I, I kept that feeling inside, um, and that drove me to say, "Hey, I'm going to do something different." Because again, I had siblings in that motel room, and we would watch my mom and dad come in from a day of uh, shoplifting, go into the motel room and shoot up drugs, and come out like zombies. And I became I think that became a place. So my sister who became on drugs, and my brother who um, who became a drug drug addict, and my brother who got involved in gangs. They almost became um, to a point where that became a little familiar to them. Like, is that it? I'm curious to know what happens to mom when she comes out of this this state of uh, of uh, intoxication or whatever it may be, though. But for me, I was I was a kid who was like, I don't want no parts of that. I was angry for it, and I, I just kept driving myself. And I said, I'm going to make sure that that one, I'm going to be like on the, been on a plane with the oxygen mask. That I got to take care of myself first. But others who have the same drive and who want to do something as well, I'm going to try to bring along with me. I'm going to be the encourager. So oftentimes I talk back to a lot of my friends today. Many of them don't necessarily know my personal story back then, but they always said, you, you were a pr pretty positive guy. You were the guy who was always telling us we should consider doing this, consider that. And again, um, some people said, hey, you're being preachy and all this other stuff. But I really wasn't. I was just being a natural motivator just saying, hey, man, let's let's do something different than what we're seeing right now. Because, again, the gangs. The battle was becoming between being an athlete or being a gang member in my neighborhood. So I'm saying we have a choice. Let's uplift and, and stay focused on the sports aspect because we can't change the tide of the, the gangs, but we can show people a different aspect of that. So uh, great question though, as well. 
was there some freedom around this idea of like, hey, the worst has already happened to me. Yeah, yeah. And so now let's just go out and make something out of it. Like I imagine even in like sports, like, hey, I'm going to miss a shot or, you know, we're going to lose a game or, you know, w- whatever it is. Um, like I can't imagine that affected you as much as it may, may affect other folks. You're like, you know what? Like the fact that I'm here is unbelievable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you're so right in that. You know, one of the things I learned how to do during this time, I can't say that I was always saying, hey, if I do this right here, I know this is going to work out. One of the things I learned how to do was just simply put my head down and keep grinding and keep grinding and keep grinding and keep grinding. Even when I was a senior in high school and, um, you know, shout out to uh, Bridget here who's on as well. Uh, Her aunt was one of my all time favorite teachers at Mullen High School, uh, Sister Brendan. Um, I kept grinding because I had people supporting me, but I somehow suspected, though, if I kept grinding that in the end, something would eventually break and work out in my favor. So again, it wasn't it wasn't that I had a lot of evidence initially that it was going to work out this way, but I just kept simply grinding and grinding and grinding. I didn't spend a lot of time talking about my circumstances. Well, I spent more time focusing on my vision because mm-hmm. again, talking about my circumstances when I was going through it was going to take my focus off of where I was trying to get to and focus more of my time and attention on where I was. And in order for me to get beyond where I was, I had to have something bigger than that was going to be bigger than where I was. Because again, if you if you have a dream, but your dream is not bigger than your circumstances, your circumstances will trump your vision and your dream. So you got to have a vision and a goal that is big that gets you excited, to get you pumped up. That's going to keep you going on your darkest days, and it's going to it's going to be bigger. That becomes your reason to say yes when everything else around you is telling you no. At what point did your dream become? I'm going to be a doctor, yeah, and this is the life I'm going to lead. And uh, what led you to that decision? That's a great question. And and actually, ironically, it came when I was at the University of Minnesota getting ready to get kicked out of there. Clint, can you believe that? (laughs) I got to the University of Minnesota after two years of partying and hanging out. I was sitting before the athletic director. His name was Dr. McKinley Boston. He was a former uh, University of Minnesota great African-American athletic director. I remember him telling me, I'm looking at his name tag. I'm looking down saying, Dr. McKinley Boston. I'm looking at this black. This is the first time I ran across a black guy by the name of Doctor of Anything. And he's telling me in the meantime, he's about to kick me out of the school. And I'm like, yeah, okay, okay, yes, yep, I got you, I got you. And it planted a seed in me to say, wow, if this guy right here can become doctor, I think I can do the same thing. Now, again, I didn't know what the blueprint was going to be to get there, but it struck in me this curiosity to say, wow, I've come across an African American guy who was doctor. Maybe I could do the same thing. And that always stuck with me over the years. But so in that moment of downtime, getting get kicked out of the University of Minnesota, it sparked in me a yearning to know what it was going to take to become a doctor. And in my journey, once I became a principal, there were people who, who told me, they said, OK, you're a principal now. You don't have to become a doctor. I'm like, no, I, I want to become a doctor because it's so personal. Because at that point in the stage, a clinic was more so about showing other, not only African-American kids, but other kids who were coming from tough situations, though, that you could achieve the highest level of education that you could. Now, keep in mind, I was also a kid who had a learning disability. I struggled with reading. Mm. So it to come from all that right there to obtain the highest level of education that one can obtain, um, I wanted that to be an inspirational and aspirational fact for many people who were searching for reasons to stay in school, stay connected to your goals, stay connected to your dreams, to say, this guy went from being homeless to doctor. I can do the same thing. And at what point did you decide, like, hey, I'm going to get my doctorate in education? Or I, I'm just assuming you got it in, like, some uh, some some version of, of education. Why 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 education? Why did you want to go into that field? Yeah. You know what? Education is the, the front lines to a lot of, lot of the challenges that we see in this world. You know, I think if we can get people to buy into education, if we can get our politicians to, to fully fund education, support our teachers and giving them the salaries that they need, um, inspire our teachers to be the best they can be, and have them to inspire their students, we can break a hold of a lot of the challenges that we see and face in our society. So I'm a big fan of education equals opportunity. Educations can, education can be the answer to a lot of the challenges that we face and see taking place from the inner cities to suburbs to rural communities. If you get the education, show kids how to become enlightened and not just be a, 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 a student who knows the right answers, but knows how to get to the right answer knows how to think beyond school, we can have a population of individuals who can be very, very productive and be citizens that can add to um, our society in many different ways. So 
I wanted to, to pursue that because I, I'm a firm believer that education opens up opportunities. It can be the, the, the element that, that prevents a lot of the things that take place with poverty, homelessness, um, and a lot of other things that take place in our society. Your circumstances now are obviously drastically different than, than when you were growing up. They're, they're incredible. And you've really, you know, made something and shown up for yourself. And in this world, um, had incredible accomplishments. And, there, and there's something that I want you to talk about that, that you're working on that, that we'll get to. But you've written books. You've done all, the, all these various things. Yeah. And I just wonder, like, now, how are you dreaming beyond your current great circumstances? Yes, yes. That's another great question there. You know, one of my biggest dreams now is to create a feature film that's going to inspire millions around the globe to have hope. So uh, my team and I, we've been working on this. this um, I've been at this since 2017. I've just gotten a, a team that we've been at this for the last year, but we're really working on getting the feature film nailed down, bringing on talent and then uh, raising the money so we can get this film out there within the next year, though. So, again, and even the mission behind this, Clint, is to um, make sure that people see a story because, yes, I've written a book, but there are a lot of people who aren't readers out there. So I wanted to create a number of avenues to be able to reach people where they were, uh, depending upon what your learning style was, what your preferences were. Um, I also I have also even rapped a song, Clint. It wasn't good, <laughs> but I attempted to rap. So I, when I go to schools and talk to kids, I say, hey, you can be a rapper and a doctor at the same time. They, they find that pretty humorous. But um, I'm looking forward to this movie being a point of inspiration to a lot of uh, folks globally and uh, connecting with a lot of folks uh, on, on a wider audience. Water what water. lessons did you learn as a principal? <laughs> that that must have been rewarding and like seeing kids that, you know, um, putting yourself in their shoes and how do I help them improve and things like that. What lessons did you learn uh, in leadership and really just about life when you were doing well, that? The lessons I learned probably started before I became a principal. I was actually uh, managing with McDonald's before uh, going into a principalship. So one of the great lessons I learned in the McDonald's uh, management training program was to learn how to lead through other people. You have to be able to work through other people to get things done. So when I became a principal, yes, I wanted all my students to be great, but I had to be able to work through my teachers and educators in my building to be able to reach to the students, to be able to reach the students. So if I was not making my educators feel great, appreciated, feel as though they were valued, that they can accomplish all their goals and dreams, they were not going to do it with the students. So yes, I was there for the students, but I had to be able to work through the educators to get it done first. And one of the things I did when I remember going into the school, uh, Clint, after I got the position. And I looked around and I went in the teacher's lounge and they had fold-up chairs in there. It, it looked really it looked really depressing. So one of the things I told my secretary, I said, get rid of all that stuff. I went to a hotel liquidation store. I told them that was a school. told them I was trying to change the culture of the school. And they gave us this executive um, office equipment. It, it, was, it was beautiful. So when you walked in the, the conference room, it was a, a oak table. It was a, a red oak. It was, it was beautiful. Just Beautiful. We changed up the, the lounge. We repainted the lounge. We made the office look better. And my message to my, my staff were that we were, yes, we were serving students who were low income. But we were not a low income school. We were a first class school serving first class students. And we were going to be first class in everything we did. And that was our mindset in everything we did. We expected students to rise to the occasion. We expected the adults to rise to the occasion. We expected families to rise to the occasion. So in my school of 700 kids, we only have one suspension the entire year. Oh, we wow. had heavy parent involvement. We had the mayor involved. We had the police and chief, who were, the police chief who was also a mentor. We had school board members who were serving as mentors. So whenever you came to my low income school, you got a chance to see adults everywhere. And oftentimes they weren't necessarily adults who were parents of the students. So we simply had to shift the game and the mindset to say, let's bring in the resources. Because oftentimes what happens, uh, you know, in organizations, we see we want things to happen one way. So I have to get the staff to shift to say, OK, even if the parents aren't coming in, we just need adults to support us in making sure that the kids are being successful. Even when organizations, you know, we get used to doing things a certain way. You know, there's a certain culture. You got to be able to step back sometimes and say, OK, what is the end goal we're shooting for? And are there other pathways to get there other than what we've traditionally done? And oftentimes when you sit back, have some team meetings, um, feedback. And other things you start to discover that there's other ways to get there without going about it the same way you've done uh, in the past. I wonder like what you think about the current state of education, the future of education, you know, AI obviously is throwing a wrench in a lot of these things for teachers, but I just wonder generally like 
the programs, how we're dealing with children. I mean, COVID-19, yeah. taking kids out of school for a year. I just wonder, like, what do you, how do you think the current, what do you think the current state of education is? Yeah. You know, unfortunately, COVID experience, uh, exposed what was already there. You know, uh, one of the things, a lot of teachers aren't getting the pay they did. I mean, teachers should be getting paid far more than they're getting paid. I mean, think about this. Your teachers touch every element of our society in terms of mm -hmm. career. Um, our teachers are being asked to do more than just be teachers. And, I, and when I say teachers, I need to expand that. Educators in general are being asked to do far more than what they're being told that they do on paper. So, you know, a lot of them are being nurses. Uh, you got to be social workers. You got to be the counselor. You got to be a therapist. You got to be friends. You got to be mentors. So they're being asked to, to do all these things. And then with the new administration that comes in, they have their agenda. You got to adjust. And so we got to find ways to better support our educators, period. And then when we know when the educators are motivated and supported and inspired, that trickles down to our students. And then before educators, we got to go to our leadership. We got to get good leaders in there who are stable, leaders who know how to lead and not simply um, occupy a space because some leaders in some situations occupy spaces, unfortunately. We got to have leaders who are willing to make courageous decisions when it comes to decisions in education. You got to be able to scrap some of the things that, that your teachers were told to do for many, many years that aren't working and start new and start fresh and be innovative and be change makers. But you got to be open to new ideas. But um, we know that if we can if we can support our teachers better, because one of the things I experienced uh, Clint during the COVID was the great teacher resignation. Mm -hmm. A lot of the teachers who re resigned, they, they talked about the workload, but again, it was bombarded by not being or feeling appreciated from the pay. So when mm -hmm. you value people, when you value people, mm -hmm. you get a level of commitment that is far greater than what we see in most organizations. And, I, and, and it didn't just happen in education though. Organizations across the country experience people leaving in great numbers. And part of it is in the past, we have had people who have been compliant okay, with organizations. Mm -hmm. They simply work for paychecks and other perks, but the organization themselves didn't get a chance to, they didn't go deeper and find out what it was that the person, what, what drove the person, what they, what it was that they enjoyed. They didn't, we didn't invest in the people part of running a business like we should have. So when the opportunity came for people to jump ship and find something different, it was very, very easy, including education as well. So now when we start spending more time, when we start talking about more the motivational aspects, the biggest part of motivation is you got to start with first, what is the value that, you, that your employees value? So that means I need to spend some time away from coming up with my own strategies and ideas of what I think they value and go spend some time and connect with my employees to find out what it is that they value, what's important to them, what's their goals, what's their dreams, what's their aspirations. And how can I paint a vision of how they can get that done within this organization? And then how can I, as a leader, become their greatest cheerleader? Because leaders, oftentimes, we look for people to praise us. But if you're your greatest coaches, you think about Tony Dungy. On game mm -hmm. day, Tony Dungy didn't do a lot of coaching. He simply praised his, he praised his, uh, his, uh, his, his players. He let his assistant coaches do the work, and he became a cheerleader. That's what great leadership looks like. Yeah, it's, it's interesting when you talk about valuing and like what we value in a society, how we value um, various professions and various, you know, walks of life. As you think, you know, I think about the great resignation of the teachers and like, why wouldn't they resign? I mean, right. that was an impossible task, an impossible ask for, like you said, like very little money. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. You can really tell where as a society values people by money. Money's information yes. first yes. and foremost, more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And so the information that money gives us is like, Hey, educators aren't that important. Absolutely. Teachers aren't that important. Yes. How do you change that? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't really understand how that, how that could possibly be true. It seems to me like educators would be one of the top and yes. most important professions in society, right up there with a doctor or lawyer or whatever, you know, the, the, the big professions are, in society, it blows my mind still to this day that they're not valued the way that they should be. And I just don't know why. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on how um, that might change. Yeah, you know, that's another great question. And when you look at where the U.S. stands academically to other uh, countries around the world, we're slowly, slowly dropping. Mm -hmm. okay? And if we're going to change that, we have to invest more because what we focus on grows. 
So we're going to invest more in the education. It has to start with paying people their value and what they're worth and what they're putting in. So we got to get the right politicians in place who know and understand what it means to be a teacher, to be an educator, to work inside these buildings, to know what it's like to be um, that best friend to a kid who doesn't come to school with any food, um, to know what it means to take your lunch break and spend it connecting with kids who couldn't do math problems or reading problems. You start seeing education totally different when you get, your chance, get a chance to get in the building and see what it is that they actually do. I would love to see a requirement where more of our politicians, our community leaders, our business folks actually go into our schools, spend a day with teachers, actually walk in their shoes, do a, do a, uh, a career swap. Let our teachers become the CEOs of some of these companies for the day and let our CEOs and, and politicians go into school buildings and teach classes for a day. That right there, my friend, will begin to change the trajectory of how we value educators and how we um, um, pay them as well. I love that. And I can tell you the CEOs and politicians would think, man, this is really hard. Yes. Uh, you know, spending a day in a classroom and the teachers would spend a day in their shoes and be like, man, this is actually rather easy. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm getting paid millions of bucks for this. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> which, which again is just so crazy how we value things. I wonder even just broader outside of education as you look at the world, the state of the world, the state of leadership, <clears throat> not just in the United States, but particularly in the United States. And it seems like uh, the world has become super divisive and, you know, kind of division leads, hatred leads, um, controversy leads, all that type of stuff. One of the things that inspires me about you is you seem to just tune all that out and you're about lifting others and uh, focusing on the positives and treating everyone as though they matter. How do we get that broader? Like how do we get more use in leadership positions yeah. throughout the country and throughout the world? Yeah. Another great question there, Clint. Um, you know, one of the things I think we got to get to a place where we see each other's humanity in each other. You know, part of it is what we're experiencing in our country right now is we are, we are making up stories about who other people are. One of the things that happens, Clint, when I get a chance to sit down and hear your story, I gain a level of insights and compassion and empathy for you that I probably didn't have before hearing your story. I would love for us to go around the country doing story circles where we just simply share our stories. Those people who are on opposite polar ends, get with someone on this side, get with someone on this side, and just let them share their stories. So now you begin to understand the why that's driving the emotions. Because one of the things that allows us to connect as human beings, you may not, Clint, you may not necessarily have lived in foster homes or crisis centers, but you darn sure have been in tough circumstances before. You've been in situations where the odds have been stacked against you. And that made you feel a certain way. And when you're able to feel that certain way, we're able to connect with our emotions based upon our feelings. And now we have a level of empathy for each other that probably wasn't there prior to us not connecting our stories in our feelings. And when we do that, we start to have a different perspective of who this person may be. And we start to understand the why behind what it is that they're doing. I mean, one of the biggest pieces of marriage is discovering my wife's why, because I'm sure I drive her nuts and she has to discover my why. She drives me nuts so many days. But knowing the why behind a lot of the things that we do allows us to come together and work together. And again, when you do that, Clint, you move away from a system of compliance to commitment. We now become committed to each other. We may not necessarily agree on everything, but there's a level of commitment that we have with each other where we can share resources, share ideas, and respect each other at the end of the day. Because again, as long as we continue to stay over here and we make up stories about each other to fill in this gap, we never get to the place where we can come together and really connect. So the way we come together and connect is through our stories and through our emotions. I think that's beautiful. Like I've always thought stories are at the heart of a community and stories are at the heart of a relationship, right? Like we all have, uh, know someone, whether it's a sibling or a cousin or a close friend that we grew up with, right? Who has vastly different political views or disagrees with all this type of stuff, but you just count it all out because you know their story. Absolutely. And you're like, no, oh, who cares? I'm just not going to talk about that with them, but I know their story and they were, they were in the thick of things. And um, I was there. And, you know, like once you understand someone's story, you become empathetic. 
Yes. And you become understanding and yes. you become compassionate, which, which yes. is pretty beautiful. Yes. And we could sure use a lot more than that. It's interesting. You said like, I may not have been in foster care. I actually was random. Really? I, mean, I didn't, I didn't wow. have anywhere near um, wow. your childhood that, that you've described here, but I actually spent um, the first couple of years in childhood. And then I was adopted. Uh, wow. Wow. And me and my uh, older brother were adopted when we were wow. when I was about two or three. Yeah. It was, so yeah, there is like this thing where like, you know, understanding those stories, understanding what the circumstances people have been in, understanding kind of like how they've gotten to where they've got. And I mean, it's really hard just to stay alive, you know? Uh -huh. Yes. And, you know, one of the beautiful things, and, and I, I thank you so much for sharing that as well. One of the beautiful, beautiful things that happens when we share our stories, we allow other people to feel comfortable sharing their stories back with us. So, again, mm -hmm. I appreciate you sharing that. And we make a connection as well. So I, I love it, man. I love your resiliency that you've shown as well and with your brother as well. So. Kudos to you. Yeah, it's an, it's it's kind of a crazy system, actually. I didn't I didn't mean to go into this this topic too much, but what do you think about the foster system and you know the adoption system and that type of stuff? It it does seem like that might be a little bit broken as well, and maybe yeah. there might be some ways to improve that. Yeah, I think the foster care system and adoption system is kind of dealing with the repercussions of what we're seeing, very similar to what's happening with schools, the breakdown of the family. So in the family, imagine. My parents were arrested 121 times. Imagine mm -hmm. the, the amount of pressure that it put on my, my extended family members, my the, the foster care system to continue to try to take us in. So I think you have all these family breakdowns that are happening and it's overloading the system. So it creates a system that was probably initially designed to do well, to put it in a place where it's not functioning well because of the overload that's taking place. Even with our schools, one of the things that's happening in our schools is Teachers are being asked to do things that they weren't necessarily uh, committed to going to college for. So when we get to a place, we got to get to a place where we get back to the family structure. How do we build up that family structure again? How do we build up parents to be at a place where they feel good about themselves? They, they get the education that they can and create. They can create opportunities for them to become um, a part of the American dream, become owners, acquire assets in our country, become uh, business owners. You know, um, that's where we start taking a lot of the pressure off the system, because I think. The system, the foster care system, the adoption system is simply responding to a lot of the overload that is taking place and coming at them, though. But there are certainly things that they can do better. I can't speak to the specifics of that because I'm not necessarily into it in the system. But in relation to the school organizations, it all goes back down to that family unit. We got to strengthen the family unit so that we can create um, what well, that becomes a system and mm -hmm. use those uh, the foster care system or adoption system as a short term system to help people get back on their feet and then put the kid back in the, with the family though. What became of your parents and siblings and what relationship do you have with them now, if any? Yeah. You know, unfortunately my mother uh, passed away from damage. that was done to her body from heroin about oh, 20 I'm years. Sorry. We had a great relationship the last 10 years of her life. Uh, my father passed away during COVID unfortunately. And for my siblings, you know, we, we, um, the situations we went through made us very, very close as siblings. So we are, we're, um, we're, we're almost more than siblings. So three of them, uh, two of them live here in Charlotte here um, where I live at as well. Unfortunately, I lost my sister to cancer here a couple of years ago, my mm -hmm. oldest sister. And then my oldest brother and uh, uh, second oldest sister live in Denver, Colorado. But we love each other greatly. Um, we have a great deal of compassion for each other. And we're just so glad that we've been able to make it to the other side to be able to see where we are as we're nearing uh, middle, middle, middle age. What led you to Charleston? I'm interested in that. Charlotte, Charlotte. Charlotte, no, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry. What led you there? Well, you know, um, I'm from Denver, Colorado. We had the mountains. I grew, uh, spent a lot of time in Minnesota where we had the water. So Charlotte, North Carolina gives me the chance to, uh, to get the best of both worlds. We have the mountains here. We have the uh, the, the uh, ocean here as well. So just a great city, great place. Reminds me a lot of Denver, Colorado, a very up-and-coming city. So it's, a, it's just a great place to be. Yeah, beautiful city. You got Michael Jordan hanging around yes. there all the time, yeah. which, which is <laughs> probably pretty fun. Absolutely. Uh, that that's very cool. Tell me more about this movie that yes. you're working on and how that came about and how do you even go about doing, I mean, that's a enormous thing to, yes. to just create a movie. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I wanted to do, uh, my movies uh, and stories uh, very similar to uh, the movies blindside in pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. um, but oftentimes I tell people what you're going to see in this story is what it's like to grow up in homelessness, which is very, very different than poverty because people, talk a lot about poverty and they, and they kind of throw home and homelessness in there. One example I'll tell you that makes um, homelessness different than poverty is 
when I was in eighth grade, and we talked about that motel room, Clint, my friends lived in the projects, not to minimize their situation, but when they came home from the pro from school every day, they were getting government assistance. They knew where they were going to be at every day. They were getting help and everything else. Wasn't easy. We came home. We were living in this motel room. We didn't know when we were going to be. We didn't know we were going to be at. We didn't get food. Oftentimes, we got it back at the school. We were invisible to society. So our, my school didn't have my telephone number. They didn't have an address for us. We were off the radar screen for a lot of family members. And then in second grade, now keep in mind, we live in seven different motel rooms at different times in my journey. So I was in second grade. We were in a motel room, Clint, and we returned from doing some, maybe school or something like that. And I remember my dad went to put the key in the door, Clint, and the door wouldn't open up. And he turns to the owner who was out in the parking lot, watering the dirt in the parking lot. He says, we can't get in the room. And the guy says, you're not getting in the room. And they go back and forth. And the owner finally says, he says, get out of here. He says, you haven't paid rent. Get out of here before I call the police. And Clint, in that moment, as a second grader, I knew that everything we owned was behind that door. Mm -hmm. We had to get back into the car, go down the street to the next motel room, start life all over again as though it never happened. So this is going to be a movie that's going to shed light on what it really means and look like to be homeless in America, which we got about 2.1 million kids a year and families who are dealing with homelessness in this country. So I'm very, very passionate about it. I've been working at this project for a lot of, a lot of years. I got a lot of books that I've been reading to learn more about the industry because I'm not necessarily in the industry. But one of the things I've been able to do is surround myself with a great team who are who are in the industry. So I've got a great director that I brought on board and we're acquiring a number of talent. And um, uh, it's been a, been a lot of learning, but it's been a great process. The short film that I created uh, a few years ago is we're in, won eight awards globally. So we've done, uh, we've shown that the proof of concept is there to get uh, a movie that's going to get out there to the public, to the world, that's going to inspire them and show them something different that has not been on the screen before again. Because even with Pursuit of Happiness, you see a guy who was homeless, but you don't see the resiliency of a homeless kid and how they're fighting in this movie here. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very insightful for a lot of folks. So be, be in tune, be ready. And uh, it has my prints all over it because, again, it's my story that I wanted, told, I wanted it told with fidelity. So. Man, I can't wait. Uh, yeah, I, unbelievable. Like when that comes out, you got to come back on and, and talk about that so we can promote it to to our audience. Uh, my last question, this is the last question we ask everybody who comes on here. And again, I can't thank you enough for for taking the time, Dr. Watson. Uh, this is this has been inspirational. Um, and so th so thank you. But the, but the final question we ask everybody is um, we believe at CEO.com that the chances you give are just as important as the chances you take. Right. Yes. Like uh, we, we all get to take chances on ourselves, but it's just yeah. as beautiful to have a chance given or to give someone a chance. And, and that is just as meaningful in people's lives. I wonder if there's someone, and it sounds like you've, you probably, you've mentioned a couple during this conversation who gave you a chance, who you think of when you think about um, someone who may have uh, made a difference in that way. Yes. Yes. You know, I first start off with my, my older sister, um, Melinda Watson. She was the kid who, my parents weren't there. She was my sibling, but she was taking the role far greater than just a sibling. She was the one who was staying at home with my baby sister when we went to school to get food or stole food or what have you. And then it was my grandmother, Helen, who sacrificed much of her, her senior years, taking us in and out of foster homes and bringing us in to her home as well. And my aunt Mildred, who brought us in with her kids and family. And then I had an amazing teacher in high school who believed in me. Her name is Sister Brendan Jordan. Um, and one of the characters in my movie is also Mrs. Jordan as well. Um, but she believed in me when a lot of people didn't believe in me and she stuck with me. She, uh, she passed away several years ago, but we, I think she was 92 years old, but she was still reading my, uh, my emails and mm -hmm. my newsletters and giving me feedback on my newsletter. She was just an amazing, amazing person. I loved her to death. And then of course my high school, um, my high school football coach, Pete Levine, and then a number of other folks on the journey and, and, and my wife now, you know, my wife is supporting me big time in this movie endeavor is, is risky when you're, when you're trying to uh, create a movie. So she's supporting me in this and uh, wants to see it happen as well. And we both know that at the end of the day, this is going to be about inspiring others to be the best they can be and have hope because a lot of people who are looking for hope out there. So that those are the folks who really inspired me. And I'm hoping to be half that to uh, the kids that I'm mentoring and the people that I'm working with as well. Oh, I can tell you you're more than half of that, Dr. Watson. Appreciate just that. spending some time with you. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Again, when this movie comes out, let's let's have you on again. because uh, gotcha. I'm if you're gonna be much you're gonna be big time at that point, but but think <laughs> about us, remember us and come back on because we'd love to promote it. Hey, I loved it. I'm always committed to uh, people who supported me on the journey and you got it.
we're going to be get back on and do this thing. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Watson. Appreciate okay. it. Good seeing you. Take care.